What does it look like to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? Today on Gospel in Life, Tim Keller continues a sermon series examining how a grace-based gospel perspective for justice is the perfect answer to that question. After listening to today's message, be sure to follow Gospel in Life on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for more encouragement from God's Word. Now, here's today's message. Tonight, the scripture is found on page 8 of your bulletin. I'll be reading selections from Proverbs. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. By wisdom, the Lord laid the foundations of the earth. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided, and the clouds let drop the dew. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you have it now with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. For the Lord detests a perverse man but takes the upright into his confidence. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to keep looking at the book of Proverbs, at the subject of justice, of wisdom, excuse me, and at the heart of what the book of Proverbs says it means to live a wise life is caring for justice. You take a look here at this last verse that was just read to you. See at the very bottom? The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Justice for the poor. And this little word caring is way too weak an English word to get across what's actually being said here. The Hebrew word here is the word yava, which is the most deep and intimate and experiential word in the Hebrew language for knowledge. In fact, if you go back in the old, uh, the old King James Bible and you read what it says in the first few chapters of Genesis, it'll actually say in the English translation, and Adam knew his wife and she bore him a son, and Cain knew his wife and she bore him a child. It's the, it's the Hebrew word yava, which is... Uh, knowledge so passionate and so intense and so intimate that it's a synonym for sexuality, sexual activity that brings about the birth of children. And that's the word used here. What this is saying is you're not wise unless you are living an intensely passionate life committed to justice. Now, what is that? (laughs) And let's look at this under, um, I guess we could say four headings. Let's ask the questions, why, what, who and how. Why do we need justice? What is justice? Who does justice? And how can we be one of them? Why do we need it? What is it? Who does it? And how can we be one of them? One of the ones who do justice. Let's first of all ask the question, why? And the concept that's critical to understanding justice is the concept of shalom, that the world was made in wisdom for shalom. Now, verse 18, let's start at the beginning here. At the top, in chapter 3, verse 18, we're told that wisdom, that's what's being referred to here as she, wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her, and all who lay hold of her will be blessed. Unfortunately, the English word blessed means so little now. When, you th- when someone says it blessed me, it means I just liked it or it made me feel good. The, the word before, now, if I had It was unwise of me, actually. Unwise, get it? Verse verse 17 should have been printed on your page and read because verse 17 says, Wisdom, all her paths are shalom, peace, and all who take hold of her are blessed. And the word blessed and peace are powerful words, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, but they don't come across in our English words because blessed in English means just to be kind of feeling good and peace means just an inner calm. But shalom and blessedness, which are almost the same thing, 
in the Hebrew Scriptures are much richer and deeper concepts than that. Well, what are they? Well, let's notice. Immediately after talking about blessedness and shalom, verse 19 and 20 says, By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundation. By wisdom he set the heavens in place. By wisdom his, he divided things and designed things. The wisdom of God was how, uh, was how God created the world. So the world is not a hodgepodge. The world is a, it has an order. There's a design to it. Psalm 102 says God made the heavens and the earth like a garment, a fabric. And that is a key concept to understanding uh, what we're talking about here. Why? Well, think of what is a fabric. A fabric consists of lots and lots of threads. But notice the threads don't just lay there. If if you take a bunch of threads, you know, take 3,000 threads and just lay them on a table, and you don't have a piece of fabric. Even if they're very close proximity to each other, they have to be interwoven. Each thread has to go over, under, around, and through the other threads hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of times, and then and only then is the fabric beautiful, and then and only then is the fabric strong and useful. Now, this is what the Bible is saying about creation. God did not just simply make the world by throwing millions and billions of little entities into it, But God made the world and put all those millions and billions of entities into it to be beautifully, interdependently, harmoniously knit together and webbed together. And that knitting and webbing and that that interdependence is what the Bible calls shalom. Now, let's break this down. For example, your body. Boy, when your body, especially when it's young, everything is, you're, 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 you look good and you feel good and you're healthy and you've got energy. You know why? Because every part of your body is knit to every other part. It's webbed together. It's working together. It's in unity. It's all fit together. All disease, all injury, aging itself and death is the breaking apart of the th- parts of your body which ought to be together. And, of course, when you actually die, literally the parts of your body fall to pieces. So when you're sick or when you're injured or when you are aging and you're being weighed down and when you're about to die, what's happening is you're losing the experience of shalom. Physically, let's move on. Internally, you've got parts. You've got your conscience. You've got your emotions. You've got your reason. And when your conscience and when your emotion and your reason are all together when the things you most desperately want are the things that make the most sense and the things your conscience tells you are the right things, you experience shalom, inner shalom, absolute flourishing, everything knit together. But what happens when you get into one of these situations, and there's many of them, in which you desperately want something with your emotions that your conscience is telling you you shouldn't have, it's not right, and then you start to experience the loss of shalom, an unraveling of the fabric, an unraveling psychologically, that's, that's, that's uh, uh, analogous to the unraveling of the physical, the disintegration. And, you've, and you experience anxiety, and you experience inner conflict, and you experience meaninglessness, and, and you experience anger. You're losing shalom. Let's move to uh, the social. Move to the social for a minute. Have you ever been part of a neighborhood where everybody cared about everybody else? Where if, if, if you had a need of any sort, everybody was there for you. You needed to move something in, everybody was there for you. You had had to go to the hospital, everybody was there for you. You had a a financial need, everybody was there for you. You see, it's one thing to be in a neighborhood and everybody's a thread, as it were, and you're right alongside of each other, that doesn't mean that you're interwoven. Neighborhoods in which everyone is interwoven with everyone else, financially, socially, physically, when you're really spending time with each other, when you're actually plowing your time and your talent and your efforts into the lives of the people around you, instead of being selfish, then your family is strong. It's a beautiful fabric, you know, and your community is strong, your neighborhood is strong. But when people live for themselves, you have the loss of social shalom. You have social breakdown. You have poverty. You have racial tension. You have war. You have crime. That's the reason why shalom is this is what God made the world for. And it's a powerful and incredibly rich concept 
and it's, it's, it's what God made in wisdom creation for. And so one uh, theologian puts it like this. He says, this is shalom, the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in equity, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. We translate it peace, but in the Bible it means far more than mere peace of mind uh, or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully are employed all under the arch of God's love. Shalom, in other words, is the way the world ought to be. And that's the reason why human wisdom human wisdom is discerning this divine wisdom and order in the world. Human wisdom is discerning the interwovenness of life and acting accordingly. So the wise man or woman tells the truth. Why? When you lie, you're unraveling the social fabric. You're isolating yourself from someone else. You're exploiting them. You're withholding something, information from them they need in order to live, but they're not getting it. You're destroying the fabric. When you tell the truth, you're weaving the fabric in. A wise man or woman is generous with the money. Doesn't spend 99.9% of your money on yourself, but you spend 10 or 20% on other people. You're just giving it away to family, to the neighbors, to friends, to the church, to the poor. And when you have a community of people doing that, you see, there's an interwovenness that's happening, and people are being threaded together, and therefore there's a strong fabric. Why does a wise man or woman tell the truth? Why are they generous with their money? Not just because it's moral, because it's wise. Or put it this way, why don't they lie? Why, don't they, uh, why aren't they stingy? Because lying and stinginess are not just immoral, they're stupid. Because you are destroying the very fabric of the re- world you live in. And wisdom is understanding that interwovenness and maintaining and sustaining it. And justice is putting it back, weaving it back where it is unraveling. That's what doing justice is. Now, let's, that's getting us into our second point. But before we do, let me, let's just stop here and see the reason that we need justice is because the world was built for shalom, but it's unraveling everywhere, everywhere. And the work of justice is to go physically and, and spiritually and psychologically and socially and materially into those places where there's a, a unraveling. And the only way to do it is not just to, is, is, is for you to inject yourself into the lives of other people and spend yourself, your time, your money, your talent your emotion on others. And what that does is it pulls them back up and it puts them back in the fabric, the ones who are weak. Now, we'll get to that in a minute, but first, just a quick challenge at the end here of this first point. In New York, there's a lot of people who say, I'm not sure I believe in Christianity and I'm not even sure I believe in God, but I believe in justice. I believe in justice. Well, the challenge of this text is this. If God didn't make the world, if there is no God, if God didn't make the world in wisdom and, and, and interwovenness and for shalom, if God didn't make this world and this world is a hodgepodge and it is just an accident, then you can just, there is no, there, there's no basis for calling for justice. There's no way even to define justice. There's no such thing as justice. Not at all. See, if this world is an accident and it wasn't made for a purpose, then how can you talk about the way the world ought to be? How can you say, oh, the world isn't the way it ought to be? How can you know what it ought to be? If this world is just here by accident, here's how life goes. The strong eat the weak. Natural selection, survival of the fittest, evolution. Strong organisms eat the weak organisms, right? That's how it's done. So what could be wrong with strong people or strong nations trampling on weak nations? Ah, you say it's unjust. What you're saying is nature is crooked. Something's wrong with nature. But if nature is all there is, how could you know there's something wrong with it? Now, somebody who understood this perfectly well was Martin Luther King Jr., and Dr. King's birthday is tomorrow, and it's observed all over this country, so it might be appropriate to read something from him. When he was put in jail in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 because he was protesting segregation and he engaged in civil disobedience, a number of white ministers uh, wrote an, an article in the newspaper in Birmingham saying, how can this man call people to disobey any of the laws? And in his letter from Birmingham jail in 1963, Dr. King wrote this, quote, You ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? 
The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just laws and unjust laws. Now, how does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the natural moral law of God, and an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law of God. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal, divine, and natural law. Now, you know what he's saying? It's absolutely right. He says, if nature is all there is, then the only way we could know there's something wrong about nature is if there's a supernatural law, that there's a, there's a God's law. If God made the world and he designed it for a certain way, he designed it for shalom, then when you see it unraveling, you say, this isn't the way it ought to be, and it's wrong, and it's unjust, we've got to do something about it. But this world is all there is, and there is no God, then justice is all, it's just a matter of your opinion. It's just the way it is. There is no way the world ought to be. If you may feel that way, but you have no basis for calling uh, for justice because it's, what you consider justice is just a matter of your opinion. Why should you impose it on other people? Nietzsche was much smarter, by the way, than we are. He said, if there is no God, there can't be anything wrong with trying to grab power over other people. And he says, the people in this world who protest against power plays are themselves simply trying to get power over the people who've got more power over them. And they're doing it through their protest. Or, another way he put it is this, all moral outrage over power plays are themselves power plays. Because if there is no God, that's all there is. There's no justice. There's just power. If the world was not created in wisdom, then there's no justice. But we know, according to the Bible, according to the book of Proverbs, it was created for shalom, and therefore... Justice is restoring shalom where it has begun to unravel. Now, that leads to our second point, but it's, it can be a fairly brief point because we've already half answered the question. What is justice? And we see it here in uh, the verses a little further down in chapter 3. See, in verse 17, 18, 19, and 20, we're told God made the world for shalom. God, in his wisdom, made the world for interwovenness and shalom. Then, the book of Proverbs, the sage begins to apply it, and a little further down in the chapter, because the world was made for interwovenness, we're told this, verse 27 and 28. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you now have it with you. Now, this is very sweeping. What is it saying? First of all, it says, you must not withhold good from your neighbor. And the word good here does not mean just being nice in general. It's, it means tangible goods. It means material goods. It means money. It means tools. It means whatever your neighbor needs to flourish socially and economically. If you have got an elderly neighbor and he or she can't clean their own house and so they're having health problems, they don't have the money to do it. If you've got neighbors who can't afford decent housing, if you've got neighbors who can't get their kids into college, if you've got neighbors without goods, and you've got the power that you've got more of those goods than they do, it is your responsibility to share. And the responsibility is not just simply to share, but to, of course, weave your life in with theirs. See, doing justice, once you understand shalom, is not just simply going to court to get something rectified. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's true in the Bible that when, see, the English word justice has, in your, your in my mind, means legal. And there's no doubt that in the Bible, doing justice does mean uh, equity and, uh, and honesty and integrity and, and, and civic justice. And of course, that's part of what the Bible means about doing justice. But once you understand the concept of shalom, you begin to realize that doing justice, according to the Bible, is a broader and more comprehensive thing than that. And what that means then is that you must not just be a thread next to the other threads, but when you see other people falling out of the fabric, people who don't have the goods, people who are falling out of the social fabric, who are being told to fend for themselves and they don't have the power to do it, it's your job, it's your responsibility to put your lives, get involved with them. And that's what it means to thread yourself. We don't want to be involved. We're so busy. But you have to. We have to thread ourselves our money, our time, our love, our effort into the lives of people who are weaker than we, who have fewer goods than we. It's our responsibility. And let me show you how strong the Bible is about this responsibility. 
I couldn't believe my eyes when I tried to read this in the Hebrew, and in English it doesn't come across terribly well. So uh, I couldn't believe it. You notice it says, Do not withhold good from your neighbor, for they deserve it. See, now, if you take verse 27 in uh, isolation verse 28, you could actually read verse 27 as saying, Do not withhold good things from those who are deserving. As if there's some deserving people out there and there's undeserving people and you only have to help the deserving people. But that's not true. It's talking about your neighbors, anyone you live near. So what's this word deserve mean? Well, it's, it's a Hebrew word that means an owner. It's hard to translate. It means an owner. It's the Hebrew word bail, which actually means to own something or to be lord over something. And it's saying that your neighbor, who doesn't have as many goods as you, owns your goods. So I looked everything up. I mean, I couldn't believe what I was reading, and I checked every lexicon, and I got out my new Bible software that my son's got me for Christmas, and I checked everything to make sure I wasn't making a mistake. And you know what it says? Here, let me just tell you what it's literally saying. If you've got things that your neighbor doesn't have, give them to him because you owe him. He has claim on your goods. He owns your goods as much as you do. And if, now, Americans go, wait a minute. <laughs> Haven't you heard of private property? Of course, the Bible's heard of private property. It does say thou shalt not steal. The Bible understands private property, but it doesn't have anything like the individualistic understanding of life that Americans do, and here's why. Do you know what this is saying? I would think like this. My illustration that helps me the most, uh, and I've occasionally used it, to understand what the Bible means by justice is, is the reflection that I've had over the years living in New York City. In New York City, there are a lot of kids right today growing up in neighborhoods. And because they're growing up in these particular neighborhoods, they're going to grow up functionally illiterate. This is just one example, but I think it helps. Because part, it's a whole lot of things that are happening, and they're growing up functionally illiterate. And by the time they're 16, 17, and 18, they can hardly read and write at all. So not only do they not have marketable skills, but they don't even have the literacy skills that will enable them to get the marketable skills, and their economic and social future is horribly bleak. Why? The liberals say because of social, in, socially unjust structures. The conservatives say because of the breakdown of the family. But nobody says it's the kid's fault. Nobody says it's the kid's fault. Here's the answer. Why are those kids in that condition? Because they were born there and they weren't born in my family. See, the three kids that were born in my family have two or three hundred times better prospects for economic and social uh, success just because they were born there and they weren't born in Tibet or they weren't born in some inner city community in New York City just by being born there. So what is the answer of why this is true? It's because the shalom of the world is, un is unraveled because there is an inequitable, an incredibly inequitable distribution of opportunity and resources in this world. And therefore, if you happen to have been born into a place or you happen to have had the breaks or you happen to be in a situation where you got the goods of this world, if you don't share your goods with those who don't have them, it's not just stinginess, it is injustice. That's what the Bible says. Do you understand doing justice? What does it look like to pursue justice in today's world? The Bible is a fundamental source for promoting justice and compassion for those in need. Discover a life of generous, gracious justice empowered by an experience of grace in Tim Keller's book, Generous Justice. As thanks for your gift to help share the gospel with others, we'll send you a copy of the book to enrich your perspective on what it means to pursue justice in today's world. Go to gospelandlife.com slash give and request yours today. That's gospelandlife.com slash give. Because the gospel changes everything. So that's why we have to, that's why we need it. And secondly, that's what it is. Now thirdly, who does it? Who are the people who do it? Go near the bottom, this, or the uh, third and fourth from the bottom. And we have this little couplet from chapter 11 that's really a very important couplet in my life and thinking, and in the life of Redeemer, too. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it's destroyed. Now, what is this describing? First, it's describing a discrete group of people, right? And this discrete group of people have prospered in the city. Now, the word prospered here is a very strong word that really means they have risen to the top. 
They've become absolutely successful. They've risen to the top of their fields. They have wealth, they have influence, they have power in the city. But the rest of the city doesn't resent it. The rest of the city doesn't envy it. The rest of the city rejoices to see their prosperity. And the word rejoice, this is another thing that happens when you get out all the lexicons and everything. This word for rejoice is never used except in this uh, verse, I suppose, other than to describe the exultation that comes after military victory. When a nation has achieved a military victory so they're not going to be overrun, you know, and all enslaved, they exult. And that's the word that's used here, which is to say there's a group of people who are such, they are such a character that when they get to the top of the city, when they get to the top of their professions, when they get to the top of influence and wealth and power in the city, everybody exults because everyone feels that it's a victory for them all. It's a victory for them all. Now, who are these people? They are the tzaddik or the tzaddikim. And uh, tzaddikim is the plural. And the real problem we have is we do not have any English word that gets across this powerful concept. They're, it's called the righteous. They're called the righteous. And, of course, in English, our word righteous is so wimpy now. In fact, it's almost a negative word, right? How do you use the word righteous? You can say, well, you were pretty righteous about that, weren't you? And that means rigid and dogmatic. At the very most, when you and I think of a righteous person, we think of a morally upright person. That's not what it's talking about. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be enough to make the whole city rejoice. No, you know what it is? Here's what the Greek, here's what, pardon me, here's what the Hebrew lexicons say. Listen, the righteous, the tzaddikim in the book of Proverbs, are by definition those who are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community. These are the just, the tzaddikim. The righteous in the book of Proverbs are by definition those who are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community, while the wicked are those who put their own economic and social and personal needs ahead of the needs of the community. Well, let's put it like this. Do you realize what this is? Are you the kind of person, are you the kind of family that everyone else in your neighborhood looks at and says, I don't believe what that person believes. I don't have their faith. I don't believe their religion. But I shudder to think what this neighborhood would be like without them. They are pressing so much value into our neighborhood that I don't know how we'd replace them. Is anyone talking about you like that? Because, you see, if you were one of the just, if you were one of the righteous, if you were at Sadiq, that's how people would be talking about you. They'd be rejoicing that you were in their presence. Or what kind of church would we have to be? Think about this. What kind of church would we have to be that everyone in this city who knows about us would say, I don't believe all that they believe, but I shudder to imagine what this city would be like without that church in it. They are pressing so much value into our community that I don't know how we'd replace them. What kind of church would you have to be for the city to rejoice that you were there? Not just a growing church. I mean, you can, you can propagate your teaching, you can propagate your doctrine, and you can persuade people to embrace your faith, and you can grow and get bigger and build, build bigger buildings, but that's not going to be enough. It, it doesn't say when the righteous prosper, the righteous rejoice, and the rest of the city says, grump, 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 they're taking up all the parking places. What kind of church would you have to be? What kind of church would we have to be to be one of the, the to be the Saudi Kim, to be a church that does justice? To be a church that the, that the rest of the city would say, I don't even believe what they believe, but I don't know what we'd do without them. You see, when you came to New York, what was in your mind? Your culture trained you to say, I'm coming to New York in order to plunder it. First of all, I'm going to incorporate the coolness of New York into my self-image. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to write all my friends and email all my friends and say, I live in New York and you don't. That makes me cool. I mean, you don't say it. You don't put it out there, but, you know. And, and then, of course, you plunder New York for all of its, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of incredible, you come here to be recognized. You come here to make it. You come here to, to uh, meet the people who are going to help you make it. Uh, you, or did you come here, not the way the culture says to come here, Did you come here as one of the just, saying, I want to make this place a great place for everyone to live? 
I want to find the parts of the city that are unraveling, and I want to thread myself into them. I want to plow. I, see, the, the, the just have two goals when they come to a city. They want to prosper. They want to make it. They want to get to the top. They want to do well in government. They want to do well in business and the arts. They want to get... Why? To reweave the shalom of the city, to do justice. To dis, they will disadvantage themselves in spite of all that they're making to advantage the community. And then the community will rejoice that they're in their midst. And that's what Christians are called to be, and that's what the Christian churches are called to be. And until we are that, we really shouldn't complain about our image. Now, lastly, the question, okay, are you feeling guilty enough yet? (laughs) Well, I do have one more point, and here's, listen, if you're feeling guilty by now, stop. You know why? Guilt puts pressure on you from the outside without changing you on the inside. Guilt puts pressure on you from the outside to do justice. But that's not going to make you one of the just, one of the just doers. It's not going to do that. You need to be changed from the inside. Now, how are you going to get that? By looking and grasping the teaching of this last verse. It's actually the second last verse in the, on the page. It's a wonderful little proverb, even at its practical, superficial surface level, but it's got a principle in it that's going to change you. It says, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. Now, it's a mar- even on the surface, it's a marvelous little promise. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what is done. Banks still tend to redline lower-income communities, something banks are not supposed to do, they're not allowed to do, but they still do it. I've been reading about it recently. Uh, to, what, the, what a bank does is it redlines a, a lower-income community because they know that if somebody in a lower-income community asks for a loan, they, just, they know the statistics, that they're much less likely, those people there are not le- much more likely to you know, not make good on the loan, not, not pay the loan back, maybe not pay it back at all. So they, what they do is they make it very hard for people in certain communities to get loans. Here's what God is saying to you. Don't you dare redline anybody. Don't you dare look at anyone and say, there's a black hole. Don't you look at anybody and say, if I get involved with that person, you just give and you give and you help and you <laughs> they just never get any better. Don't redline anybody because a gift to the poor I see as a gift to me. And I will enrich you one way or another. I will make the loan good. Now, even on the surface, isn't that an incredible... Do you have anybody in your life that you keep trying to help and they just they'll never get any better and it seems like they're just this black hole, they're just going to suck you dry of money, of time, of motion? God says, don't redline them. God says, don't do that. Because everything you're giving to them, when you give to the broken, when you give to the poor, when you give to the messed up, you're giving to me, God says, and I will make the loan good. Don't worry. I'm no one's debtor. No one has ever given me more than I gave back to them. But you know what? There's a deeper principle. And here's the principle. God identifies with the poor. Do you see this? He says, if you lend to the poor, you're lending to me. And actually in Proverbs 14.31, he goes a little further and he says, if you insult the poor, you insult me. If you honor the poor, you honor me. And you see this again and again in the Bible. And it's a very deep and important spiritual principle, and you have to grasp it, friends, brothers and sisters. God identifies with the poor. Now, the most vivid example of this of all is in the New Testament in Matthew 25. And Jesus says that on Judgment Day, God is going to sit on a throne, and we will all stand before him, and he's going to look at some people, and he's going to say this, I was hungry and thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to eat or drink. I was a stranger, I was an immigrant, and you didn't give me a home. I was naked and threadbare, and you didn't give me clothes. I was sick, and you didn't heal me. I was a prisoner, and you didn't visit me. And everybody's going to say, when did we see you thirsty? When did we see you naked? When did we see you uh, a prisoner? We've never seen you before in our lives. When did that happen? And he's going to say, God, uh, Jesus says, God is going to say on that last day, when you walk by those people in this life, you were walking by me. I was in them. Now, you have to be careful. It's not saying, Jesus is not saying, the way you get a relationship with God 
is by helping the poor. It's saying the way you can tell whether you've got a relationship with God is your attitude toward the poor. See, if you're a Pharisee and you think I've lived a pretty good life and therefore God owes me, in other words, if you're middle class in spirit, (laughs) you're going to look at the poor and you're going to say, well, why don't they do something? But if you're poor in spirit, if you know that God did not redline you, if you know that even though you didn't qualify for the loan, God invested in you and invested in you and invested in you and that you are saved by grace, if you're poor in spirit, you cannot possibly look at the poor with any superiority. You know you're looking basically in a mirror. And therefore, what God is saying is, I identify with the poor. I, you know, there was this... I am the poor man on your doorstep. I am the homeless woman. I am the prisoner. I am the naked. I am the thirsty. And the way you know you've got a relationship with me, a real saving relationship with me, based on grace, is by how you relate to them. Well, some of you say, you're still just making me feel guilty. I still feel this pressure on the outside, but I'm not sure I'm feeling on the inside. Well, here's how you get on the inside. When the Old Testament, when the Hebrew Scripture says God identifies with the poor, it, you have to get to the New Testament before you finally find out the degree to which God has done that. When God came to earth in Jesus Christ, he came as a poor man. He was born in a manger. When his parents had him circumcised, the offering was the offering that was, that was acceptable from, to the poorest, the lowest uh, rung of the social ladder, two pigeons, not a bull, not a goat, two pigeons. When he died, the only possession he had was his robe, and they cast lots for it. You know, he ate his la- he spent his last night in a borrowed upper room. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But Jesus did not, God did not just come and identify himself with the poor. He identified himself with the oppressed. Jim Boyce, fine preacher, friend of mine who's now dead, was in Philadelphia for many years, preached a sermon some years ago called The Illegalities of Jesus' Trial. And what's intriguing about that is it's all about he went back and looked at Jesus' trial, and he, and he checked out the Roman and the Jewish uh, you know, rules of jurisprudence, and he discovered that everything that happened to Jesus was illegal, that the arrest was illegal, the interrogation was illegal, the trial was illegal, it was held late at night, there was no notification. Jesus was not allowed any defense, and he was smacked and struck in the middle of the trial. Everything about it was unjust. And wait a minute. Do you know what that means? I got people all over the place saying, I can't believe in a God when I look out in this world and I see all this injustice. But Jesus Christ, God himself, came to earth, and he knows what it's like to be under the lash. He knows what it's like to stand up to power and be killed for it. He knows what it's like to be the victim of injustice. He knows what it's like to be lynched. I don't know how you could believe in a God who had never experienced injustice in a world filled with injustice, but Christianity is the only religion that even claims that God has been subject to injustice. And where have you, do you really see the Lord of heaven naked, thirsty, prisoner? When you see him on the final day, don't say, when did we see you naked? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you a prisoner? Because the answer is on the cross. That's the ultimate place. And when you see Jesus on the cross, taking the place of the poor, taking the place of of the, of, the, of the victims of the oppressed and the victims of injustice. And when you say them do, him doing it for you, when you see him saying, I deserve justice, but I got condemnation, so that you who deserve condemnation can get justice without destroying you. And to the degree you take that into the center of your life, that will make you one of the people that everyone else in the city rejoices that you're present. And here's why. Elaine Scarry, Harvard professor some years ago, wrote a, a book called On Beauty and Being Just. You heard of that book? Pretty interesting book, On Beauty and Being Just. And its theory is, and this is talking, she's talking personally here. She's, her theory is an experience of beauty makes you, turns you toward justice. In her own experience, that when she sees something beautiful, whether it's music or 
art or a literature or, or something in nature, that when she is overwhelmed with beauty, she says, it fills me up and it gets me out of myself. It, 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 it heals me of my self-centeredness and moves me out toward other people. And I don't know whether that's true of all experiences of beauty, but I know it's true of this one. If you see Jesus thirsty, hungry, a prisoner, if you see him identified with the poor in his death for you, taking the, inju- taking the condemnation when he deserved justice so that we, though we get, deserve condemnation, get justice without destroying you, to the degree you take that into the middle of your heart and see that as the ultimate beauty, it will turn, turn you into one of the sadikim. And if we have whole churches filled with people who understand what Jesus has done for them, then truly the city will rejoice. What do you think the gospel is? Do you think the gospel salvation is about getting yourself right with God, doing this or that, and then you go to heaven? Let me tell you what the gospel salvation is. It's Jesus Christ coming to earth to identify with the poor and the oppressed and defeat the powers of sin and death so someday he can establish absolute shalom again in the world. And all those people who have begun to experience the inner shalom that comes through knowing God the Father by grace through Jesus Christ and have started to have their souls knit back together with him, you become part of his program, you become part of his mission. And spreading the salvation of God is not just calling people to believe in Jesus, but it's also rehabbing their homes and visiting with them in a nursing home. What an incredible salvation! How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How world-affirming it is. How city-affirming it is. Oh, the depths of the riches of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for showing us what it means to do justice. And thank you for motivating us to do justice through radical grace and mercy. Uh, Help us to understand these things and apply them to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Gospel and Life podcast. We hope Dr. Keller's teaching inspired you to live out God's call to walk humbly with Him while pursuing justice and loving mercy. And don't forget to follow Gospel and Life on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for more encouraging content. Thanks again for listening to Gospel and Life.